Monsieur Michel, I must ask you a few questions, if you don't mind. I will do everything I can to help. First of all, tell me about yourself. Very well. My name, as you know, is Pierre Michel. I am from Calais. I've been with the company for over 15 years. Thank you. Think, Poirot, that is not a good answer. This is wrong, but I'm never far from... That was easy. Can you provide me with a listing of the passengers and their rooms, please? Yes, certainly. Are you a smoker? Indeed. Do you smoke e-cigarettes? No. Tobacco only. I would like to reconstruct with your help the events of last night. Monsieur Ratchet retired to bed. When? Almost immediately after dinner, sir. Actually, before we left Belgrade. Did anybody go into his compartment after that? His valet, monsieur. Monsieur Masterman. And then his secretary, the young American gentleman, Monsieur McQueen. And that is the last time you saw or heard of him? No, Monsieur. You forget that Monsieur Ratchet rang his bell around 12.40 a.m., soon after we had stopped. I knocked at the door, but he called out in French, Ce n'est rien, je me suis trompé. I then left to answer another bell that had just rung. Where were you at 1.15 a.m.? I was sitting on my little seat at the end of the car, facing up the corridor. Are you sure? I left a little after 1 a.m. to speak about the snow with my colleague Jean in the bar car. I came back later. There was a call. I remember speaking to you. Indeed, I remember. Carry on. It was the American lady, Madame Hobart. She thought she saw a man in her compartment. Then, around 1.50 a.m., I made the bed for Monsieur Ratchet's secretary, Monsieur McQueen. He had spent the evening talking with the English Captain Arbuthnot. At 2 a.m., I returned to my place and stayed there until dawn. What is the last station where we stopped? Vinkovsky. Could someone have come on board? Possibly. I was very busy. On into the weather, we were a few minutes late. We left at 12.10 a.m. I found a button from an Orient Express staff jacket. Did you lose one by any chance? No, monsieur. As you can see, I have all my buttons. It is not mine. I must admit I'm not right this time. No, 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 not good.
This is wrong, but I'm never far from the truth. That was easy. Think, Poirot. That is not a good answer. No, 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 no. Not good. While Monsieur Michel was chatting with Monsieur Fauché in the bar car between 1 a.m. and 2 a.m., the murderer could have escaped Ratchet's room without being seen. My little grey cells did not let me down. This appears to be a good lead. Very well, I choose to go this way. So, Poirot, I hope you are progressing in your investigation. I have not finished yet, but it is progressing, yes. I still have many questions that must be answered. I will report to you as soon as I can. The Orient Express bar is certainly well stocked.
can never have too many of these. I'm sorry. There's nothing I can add to what I've already told you. Monsieur Edward Masterman, I believe. May I ask you some questions? Mm, I can barely talk. I have a terrible toothache. We have a doctor on board the train. Perhaps... I do not need a doctor. I use essential oils. If you can find my flask of clove oil in my box, I would be grateful. Fine, if you insist. I will help you. By the smell, I think that the jojoba oil spilled on the other bottles, leaving their labels illegible. I must find another way to find which one is Masterman's toothache remedy. The weighing scale is soaked in jojoba oil. It's unusable. Ah, this old scale will do the job. To start, I must first arrange the vials from the lightest to the heaviest. Now that I know the order, I think that I can easily guess which one is the clove oil. Hmm, I don't 
don't think this is the remedy. Here is Monsieur Masterman's remedy. Here is your remedy. I hope it will help. Thank you very much, sir. Ah, oh, well. I can finally speak without too much pain. I'm ready to answer your questions. You are Monsieur Ratchet's valet? Yes, sir. That is correct. Were you told that your employer was murdered? Yes, sir. A very shocking occurrence. Think, Poirot, that is not a good... I must admit I'm not right this time. No, 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 not good. This is wrong. But I'm never far from the truth. Think, Poirot, that is not a... That was easy. At what hour did you last see Monsieur Hatchet? It must have been around 9 p.m., sir. That or a little after. I went to bed around 10.30 p.m., same as the person who shares my room, Mr. Foscarelli. He almost immediately began snoring. What did you do then? I read, sir, and I spent a while soothing my toothache with clove oil and listening to the snoring. Did you hear anything during the night? Yes. My roommate snoring. Are you a smoker? Yes, sir. I have a cigarette now and then to relax. Tell me about your employer, Monsieur Ratchet. I've been working for him for nine months. I should not wish to speak ill of the dead, but he was uh, not a gentleman, sir. Did you know that he had enemies? Yes, sir. I heard him discussing some threatening letters, sir, with Mr. McQueen. Did he mention these letters to you? He had been reading a letter when I came in. He asked me if I was the one who put it in his compartment. I told him that I had done no such thing, and he should report it to the police at the next station. How did he respond? He laughed, sir. <laughs> You're joking. I do not joke, sir. <laughs> Forgive me. I can see you do not. Was he taking sleeping pills? Always when traveling by train, sir. He said he couldn't sleep otherwise. Last night, he asked me to give him two. I did so, along with a glass of water. He dissolved them in the water. Did you see him drink the water? No, sir. I left right after I gave him the pills. Was Monsieur Ratchet a smoker? No. He finds smokers disgusting. Can you tell me again why you gave sleeping pills to Monsieur Ratchet? Yes, I gave him the pills because when he takes the train, he has trouble sleeping. The letter must have worried him. He specifically asked me to prepare the sleeping pills. I didn't see him drink the water with the pills in it. I have no way to prove he's lying. Monsieur, I believe you are not telling me the truth. What? How can you say that? We heard Monsieur Ratchet curl out during the night around 20 to 1. It's doubtful he called out after he took the sleeping pills, but it's possible he took them later. He asked me to make his drink for him. Maybe he drank it later. That's true, but it doesn't explain why Ratchet would want to take sleeping pills later that night. How could he ask you for sleeping pills when he had a meeting written in his agenda? 
I am very sure he had no meeting planned for the middle of last night. Masterman is right. The meeting in his agenda was not that day. He received threatening letters. One, it seems, last night. Did you know he had a gun under his pillow? and even asked for my help to watch over him? I find it strange that he asked you for sleeping pills when he was afraid for his life and prepared to defend himself. I'm sure I don't know. Maybe to calm his nerves, maybe out of habit. It makes no sense. Wait, please. Isn't it possible that Mr. Ratchet asked me to prepare the pills, but didn't plan to drink them for some reason? It is possible. But I am a student of character, monsieur, and the Monsieur Ratchet you describe is not the man I met. If you'll excuse me, my toothache is getting worse again. I'm afraid this time you must prepare your own clove oil. I believe I am addressing Monsieur Hector McQueen. Guilty as charged. I beg your pardon? Oh, sorry. Just an expression. Uh, my father used to say it. You must have had an interesting childhood. I am Hercule Poirot. No need to be modest. You're a detective. You are Monsieur Ratchet's secretary? I am Mr. Ratchet's secretary. Just over a year. I mainly take care of translating certain texts for him. Mr. Ratchet only speaks English. Prepare yourself. For a shock. Your employer, Monsieur Ratchet, is dead. So they got him after all. What do you mean? You are assuming he was murdered? I know he had enemies. What can you tell me about Monsieur Ratchet? He was American. He was an antiques dealer. I don't know much more. Mr. Ratchet never talked about himself or his life. But I think Ratchet wasn't his real name. And he left the United States to run away from something, or someone. Yes? He started getting letters, threatening letters. Do you still have them? I have one. Did you know that Monsieur Ratchet had asked for my help? Asked you? No, I didn't know. He knew he was in danger. When did you last see him? Last night around 10 o'clock, I should say. Did you like your employer, Monsieur McQueen? No, I did not. He was... I'm sure a, a cruel and dangerous man. I found a diary in Monsieur Ratchet's safe. Did you know about it? I kept a business appointment book, but I know he had a personal diary as well. That looks like it. Are you a smoker? Yes, I smoke cigarettes. I've tried to quit, but no luck. Can you tell me your movements last night? I went back to my compartment. I read a little. In Belgrade, I went out onto the platform to smoke, but it was cold. I quickly went back in. I then went to Mr. Ratchet's compartment to take some dictation for him. I left around 10 o'clock. I saw Captain Arbuthnot. We ended up chatting in my compartment. Then we went out on the platform to quickly stretch our legs at Minkowski. He left around two o'clock. Thank you. I will need to check Monsieur McQueen's story with Captain Arbuthnot. Can you give me this letter, please? Of course, here it is. Was Monsieur Ratchet a smoker? No, no, he hated the smell of smoke. Be 
think, Poirot, that is not a good answer. I do not think that's the right answer. This is wrong, but I'm never far from the truth. impersonated Ratchet by calling Monsieur Michel to make it seem that Ratchet was still alive at 12.37 a.m. My little grey cells did not let me down. This is wrong, but I'm never far from the truth. That was easy. Direction looks promising. The train is completely trapped because of the avalanche. Hopefully, not for too long. According to the information I have, this is a solid choice. So, my friend, have you found our killer? Not yet, but I will tell you what I have learned. Please. Our assassin could have gotten on the train at Vinkovsky disguised as a conductor, entered Ratchet's room and killed him. Then he walked out through Madame Hubbard's connecting door, where he lost a button from his jacket. 
He had to wait for Monsieur Michel to be absent. He waited too long. The train had left the station. He was trapped aboard. Indeed. He had opened the window to make it look that he'd escaped that way. However, if he waited until the train stopped again due to snow, his footprints would have been found. The murderer is still among us, on the train. There's a problem with the second-class toilets. What now? All morning passengers have been complaining that the door is locked. So I went to check. I knocked, but no one answered. I didn't think I should open it without speaking to you first. You did well, Monsieur Michel. Lead the way. I use my master key. But who is she? Is she alive? She is breathing. Then if she isn't dead, isn't she our murderer? That, my friend, is what we must find out. The ticket reads Joanna Locke, traveling in compartment 105. Miss, can you hear me? Hmm? Hmm. She's breathing. Her pulse is strong. There is no sign of physical violence. This woman is sleeping very soundly. This woman is sound asleep. Given her location, I would say she has been drugged and deposited here. Well, at least... It's not another murder on my train. The train is, of course, full. Monsieur, the list I gave you indicates that Hildegard Schmidt shares her compartment. I will want to talk to her later. For now, we will concentrate on this mysterious young lady. Let's return her to her more comfortable bed. Good idea. Pierre, locate this woman's room and fetch the doctor. Yes, sir. I will question her when she wakes up. Please, let me know what you learn. Mademoiselle Locke's compartment is 105. I suggest we return her to her more comfortable bed. Yes, hopefully she will awaken soon. A cup of tea with white residue at the bottom. A briefcase and a wagon lee conductor's jacket. And the button is missing.
we really need to find the combination. But of course you know what you're doing. It is booby-trapped, is it? So, Poirot, any luck so far? If you need a break, I can ask Jean to make you some coffee. No, that's mine. I never remember my passwords, so I make them... Book. Silent like a mouse, please. I'm sorry. You're right. I'll be quiet now. You need to concentrate. I will not utter another word. Not one. Book. There will be another murder on the Orient Express in a moment. Her driver's license confirms her identity. She is American. These are fake IDs. It's certain. The stuffed animal is the same as in the photo found at the crime scene. What a coincidence. Mademoiselle Locke appears to have been investigating Monsieur Hatchet. Mademoiselle Locke seems very interested in our victim. Of course. She has studied her target. Possibly. This badge says that Joanna Locke is an American detective with the Berkshire Police Department in Massachusetts. An American police officer? Oh. She has a gun. Come, come, Poirot. Criminals are often known to carry one. Ratchet was stabbed, not shot. But then why take it on the train? Look, she's waking up. Thanks to you, I would not be surprised if our murder victim were also waking up. I... what? Oh, my head. What's all the yelling about? Who are you? Give me a good reason why you should not be in handcuffs. I can give you a reason, Book. Whose handcuffs will we use? I have none. Do you? Well, I... You are Joanna Locke, mademoiselle? Yeah, yes, um... Joanna Locke. I'm, um... I'm a detective. Berkshire, Massachusetts Police. I have found your credentials, mademoiselle. And I know who you are, Mr. Poirot. Then if the introductions are complete, perhaps the explanations may begin. I... I I'll try. It's simple, really. I... I'm on the trail of a murderer. I had just been promoted to detective after five years on patrol. It was my first time on a major case. It had been a month since Daisy Armstrong was kidnapped. The Armstrongs were desperate for some sign of hope. I was there only for paperwork, to fill in some blanks. The investigation is now part of a pile of investigations, and my captain sent me here just to dot some I's and cross some T's. 
The crime was audacious. How could the kidnapper know which was the window of Daisy's room? No, they could use a ladder to reach it. And no, they could enter the room without being seen. The misspellings are clearly on purpose, and they didn't return the child when the ransom was paid. How could the child be taken with so many people in the house? I can't imagine the pain her parents felt when they realized Daisy was gone. How are they going to feel when they realize I have no answers for them? Only more questions. That's why I'm here. A damn computer glitch. Or somebody pushed delete instead of save. Whatever happened, we lost the nanny's deposition. So my entire contribution to the investigation is to take it again. The phone record of the night of the kidnapping. The last call was for 911. A topographical map, often more important than a road map in these mountains. Good evening. Colonel Armstrong? Yes. You're the detective they phoned about. Joanna Locke. I don't remember you. I'm newly assigned to the case. It's about time more detectives were involved. My wife, Sonia, she... she hasn't been herself. Every day is a waking nightmare for us. Tell me you've uncovered something new. I'm here to speak to your daughter's nanny. There was a computer problem. Her earlier statement has been lost. Oh. I see. We had hoped... Well, do as you wish. I won't be far if you need me. Their fairy tale became a nightmare. Shiny facial hair. The good news is that it's gold. Sympathy and support for the Armstrong family during this difficult time. Thoughtful, but never enough. What a dear child. Hello, are you Suzanne Moreau, Daisy's nanny? Yes. I'm Joanna Locke, a detective working on Daisy's case. Is there any news? I'm afraid not. How can I help you? I'm really sorry. I'm afraid I have to take your statement again concerning the evening of Daisy's disappearance. There was a computer problem. Your statement was accidentally deleted. Of course. I want to help any way I can. Tell me about that night in your own words. The Armstrongs had a party to raise money for a museum. I think. Mrs. Armstrong is on her board. I was in charge of Daisy. I stayed with the little one all evening, playing with her and reading books to her. She couldn't sleep with all the noise and the comings and goings. When did you notice Daisy was missing? I was only gone five minutes to... to phone my mother. She's in the hospital. When I returned, Daisy wasn't in her bed. I thought she might have gone to look at the party, but then... I saw the handsome note on her pillow. I screamed and screamed. I couldn't stop. Did you notice anything unusual before that? I was with Daisy all evening. Finally, she fell asleep. I didn't see anyone else or notice anything in particular. Do you have any idea who did this? No. I can't see who could have done such a horrible thing. The Armstrongs are such good people. 
like my own family. Thank you for giving me your statement again. I'll get back to you if I have any questions. I won't be far. Okay, I have Suzanne's statement. But her answers need some checking. Lyon, in France. What a lovely looking city. A toy train. Now here I am on a real one. Nothing shocks me here. This information does not correspond to what Suzanne told me. Suzanne said she left Daisy alone for five minutes, but Mrs. Armstrong says she stayed with Daisy for a while and Suzanne did not return. Hey, I'm a pretty good detective after all. The world through the eyes of a child seems so sweet. A toy castle. When I was a kid, I had a police station and a tiny squad car with a siren that really worked. Not really my style, but I'll take it. Mrs. Armstrong, my name is Joanna Locke. I'm a detective investigating the kidnapping of your daughter. May I talk to you? When is your baby due? Mrs. Armstrong? Sonia? I don't want to talk. I just want to see my daughter again. That's all that matters. The poor woman. I can't imagine how she feels. Everything looks okay here. That's it. No rookie mistake there. Mrs. Armstrong? Let me show you this. Daisy. My little Daisy. I miss her so much. How good it is to see her face. I can't imagine the pain you're feeling right now. She loved her little stuffed animal, Fluffy. She took him everywhere with her. The kidnappers took it as well. They didn't have to. That means they wouldn't hurt her, doesn't it? Every lead will be followed up. You have my word on that. Thank you. I shouldn't lose hope. Somehow. I know it isn't my case. But I just made a promise, and I mean to keep it. Do you know where I can find Miss Moreau? She's in her room. Last door on the left. Tell me about the night Daisy was taken, especially anything about your daughter and Suzanne Moreau. Apart from seeing to our guests, I took a moment to check on Suzanne and Daisy in Daisy's room. Suzanne wasn't there, but Daisy was asleep. I sat with her for 10 minutes or so. Suzanne didn't return while I was there, but there's no reason for her to sit there all night when Daisy is asleep. I went back downstairs. May I come back if I have more questions? Of course, anything I can do. Okay, the stories Sonia and Suzanne tell don't match. I should recheck my file and track Suzanne's movements.
Nothing shocks me here. That is not exactly what Suzanne told me earlier. Suzanne was on the phone more than five minutes. Score. One for the good guys. If I understand you correctly, you left Daisy when she was not asleep? The party was very loud. Daisy was too wound up to sleep. I read her a motley mule detective story to try and put her to sleep. Daisy finally fell asleep. Right before motley mule solved his case in the book I was reading her. I had to make a quick phone call. No more than five minutes. But when I came back, Daisy was gone. <laughs> It says detective on your badge. Prove she's lying. Are you sure you were only gone for five minutes? Five, six, what does it matter? It was very quick. What you're telling me doesn't really agree with what Mrs. Armstrong says. Mrs. Armstrong must have looked in right after I'd left. That's how it could have happened. But the timing of the kidnapping had to be so precise. How could it be? I need to find something more concrete. You say you were only away five or six minutes, but Mrs. Armstrong says she was alone there more like 10 minutes. And the phone record shows that you stayed on the call for more than 30 minutes, way longer than you said. My mother is extremely ill. It's difficult for me. I may have lost track of time. When I came back, Izzy had disappeared. It must have been a coincidence. You have to be precise, Suzanne. A little girl's life is at stake. Why are you doing this? I didn't do anything wrong. I would never hurt Daisy. I need to check Suzanne's story. She's panicking. Why? I should see if the Armstrongs can confirm what Suzanne told me. Joanna, that doesn't track. I don't need Mr. Poirot to tell me I'm wrong. No, no, this isn't it. Think! Come on, Joanna. That's a rookie mistake. The detective gets it right. The kidnapper places a ladder under the window to Daisy's room. Then he joins the party, just one guest in the crowd. He somehow knows when Suzanne leaves the room, then sneaks upstairs. He opens Daisy's window, carries her down the ladder and vanishes.
score. One for the good guys. The number you have called is not in service at this time. Please hang up and dial again or contact your service provider. The number Suzanne called is not in service? A hospital? I spoke with Suzanne. She was phoning her mother. That's why you didn't see her when you went to check on Daisy. Yes, her mother. I tried to call the poor woman earlier that week, but the hospital said she's been in a medically induced coma for more than two months. Suzanne told me she called her mother, but she would have known her mother was in a coma. I should see if the Armstrongs can confirm what Suzanne told me. How are you doing? Are you holding up? You know, in the military, you're supposed to have the stiffest of upper lips. The Desert War taught me that soon enough. But this, it's difficult. Damned difficult. Harder on my good lady, of course. Do you know where I can find Miss Moreau? Her room is upstairs across the hall from... Daisy's. She seldom leaves it. Did you see Miss Moreau during the party? I remember seeing her at some point, but otherwise, no. I was too busy with my guests. Wear the smile, shake the proffered hand. Miss Moreau told me she called her mother. Well, why not? I believe they are very close. And the poor woman is not well. She needs some experimental treatment that isn't available yet in France. I won't be long. Take whatever time you need. I won't be long. Take whatever time you need. The number you called that night is no longer in service. I... I... I don't understand. That's... that's the number the hospital gave me to call my mother's room. You told me you were on the phone with your mother when Daisy was abducted. As we said earlier, I didn't pay attention. And was on the phone longer than I said. But since my mother is very ill, she had to leave her home down, Lyon. Because the treatment is not approved yet in France. She is in an hospital in Boston for a special treatment. I call her every night to check on her. When I came back, Daisy was gone. I'll never forgive myself. It says detective on your badge. Prove she's lying. Come on, Joanna. You can do better. Are you sure you called your mother? Yes. Every night since she was admitted in December. Your mother had to leave a country renowned for its social security, where health care is affordable, and go to Boston for expensive, specialized treatment. I imagine that the cost of her care must be high. Did you think that your share of the ransom would pay for your mother's care? How can you think? that I would allow Daisy to be kidnapped for money. She's like my daughter. I could never imagine such a thing. Her reaction seemed sincere, but I needed to see how she'd react. Suzanne, I checked. The number you say is a hospital appears to be disconnected. That's pretty strange, don't you think? It's always worked in the past. The area code for Boston is 617. This was 413. That's our local area code. She's obviously lying, but why? She seems to really care about Daisy. Suzanne, I think you really care for Daisy. If you do, then tell me the truth. You can't have been calling your mother while she's in a coma. My mom really is in the hospital in Boston. 
She really is in a coma. I... I wasn't calling her. I was on the phone with my boyfriend, Noah. Why lie about it? Why are you panicking? Because he's gone. I haven't heard from him since the night of the kidnapping. I'm afraid he's somehow connected to Daisy's disappearance. That he was just using me somehow. But I swear I talked to him. Yes, for more like 30 minutes that night. So he couldn't have kidnapped Daisy at the same time we were talking. But he could have kept you talking so someone else could take Daisy. Yes, you can see why I lied. Can't you? I was afraid you'd suspect me of having something to do with it. You can understand that, can't you? Suzanne, I want to believe you, but you've made it harder to find Daisy. Do you realize that? Oh my god, what have I done? What's most important is not what you've done, but what you do now. Go, I'll be back to talk to you. No more lies, Suzanne. For Daisy, no more lies. Noah. The name might lead us to that little girl. I am on this case now, whether my captain wants me to be or not.